Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. Carmen McGinnis. First of all, happy Father's Day to any dads who are viewing this today. And to the rest of you, just happy Sunday. So today I'm going to talk, I'm going to address four groups of people. Children who, are, who were raised without a dad. Children who uh, were raised with a dad behaving badly. And mothers who are currently raising children in either of these conditions or who did raise children in either of these conditions. So the three things that I'm going to talk about that are important to those four groups of people are the importance of what we say to our children about their fathers, the importance of how we recover when what we said about our children's father went horribly wrong. And I'm going to talk a little bit about rewriting one's personal narrative. So <clears throat> I have no further script than that today, so I can look directly into the camera and um, speak directly to you. So being raised without a dad is obviously not uh, perhaps the ideal situation, but it does happen. Being raised with a dad behaving badly, um, sometimes that's a little bit more ideal, sometimes it's worse, as I'm sure many of you moms have already decided. And raising those two sets of children um, under either of those conditions can be tremendously difficult when you're when your mom. So um, First of all, to discuss the importance of, of what we say to our children about their fathers. I want to give you an example. I want to give you one example. But first I'm going to just explain that how very important it is that we understand that everything we say to our children about their fathers is taken to be about them, about the child themselves not necessarily about the father. Because as children, and this may vary a little bit with developmental age, it's taken from the age at which your child is developmentally, and it's important to understand that your child may be younger than his years developmentally, if there have been challenges. Um, it's taken developmentally, and it's taken as if it's being said about the child, as if the child is somehow responsible for this situation. So I'm going to give you two different examples. <clears throat> the first one um, is personal. I, as you know, those of you who uh, subscribe to my channel or view me often know, I like to use myself as an example frequently. Psychologists do this. It's part of the bonding process. And it's, it's just part of being human and it's what we know about as well. So an experience from my own childhood um, when I was 13, 14 years old, I learned from my mother that my father had been cheating on her. Well, guess what? I really didn't need to know that. She was trying to deflect blame for her um, low affect, her lack of atten attentiveness to my social needs, because really at that point, it's mostly what we get from mom is social, emotional, and, and ongoing law. Um, so she said, I'm so sorry, but you know, your father and I are going through this terrible time and um, things are just really hard right now. And I took that quite personally. I took that as if dad was somehow cheating on me. Uh, I took it as if um, I was being betrayed in some way. And I'm quite sure that my mom didn't intend me to feel it that way. She wasn't that kind of a mother. Another mother might have done, but she didn't. If anything, she probably uh, would have tried to have avoided me feeling that way. But that's how I felt. Um, some of that might have been the developmental age. I was at an age where I was starting to think about how I related to men my age, and maybe a little older. Um, and to take this just a step further, about a year and a half later, when my dad and I were having troubles, as you can well imagine, um, he told me a story about how 
my mother had cheated on him before I was even born. So um, the effect of that was that I felt, because it didn't really have anything to do with me at all, it wasn't currently happening, it was a very old story, but I felt, I felt almost like betrayed, like, well, um, what does that mean about who I am? If I was raised by somebody who did a thing like that, and I haven't known about it all these years, am I even able to read people? I mean, how, how could I not have seen that one coming? So um, that, that example hopefully really gives you an idea of how the specific words that we use with our children can um, be perceived at, from their perspective, which has nothing to do with what the words actually meant. And, and I also want to point out that in both cases, my parents were really trying to deflect blame from themselves. So, um, so that's one example, personal one. Here's another one. Um, and this is kind of an am amalgamation of three clients, uh, two that I currently have and one that I, I had um, not long ago. And uh, these are children uh, all in their, um, from about nine to... 14, 15 years old, whose parents have recently had felt that they have, mothers have recently felt that they had to tell them about dad. They felt pressured by the child. And certainly I can understand how that happens. Um, we, do, we do get pressured by our children. <laughs> Mine pressure me all the time. Um, so... Uh, when you're put in a posture, where you're, when, you're, when you're directly asked, why can't I see my father? Um, this has to be about you because you're the one that lets me see anybody I see. So wh what did, where did you go wrong, Mom, um, that, that you feel that I can't see Dad? So then you start explaining things to the child. So this, this is the amalgamation part. Um, well... Dad uh, wasn't a good father. He didn't take care of you. He could barely take care of himself. And uh, there were some incidences, and we went to court, and the judge decided that, um, that you couldn't see Dad anymore um, without supervision. And Dad did that for a while and then stopped bothering. So everything that, just imagine everything that I just said, that that amalgamation of three moms said to their children, is taken from the child's perspective at the child's developmental level, somewhere between about 9 and, and 14. Um, okay, dad wasn't a good parent. Well, I must not have been a good child, because it's about me, right? Uh, dad couldn't take care of you. He could barely take care of himself. Well, if dad couldn't take care of himself, how am I ever expected to be able to take care of myself. I guess I can only be cared for by mom, so I need mom in my life all the time to take care of me, to regulate me. So that's clearly not what moms meant to say to those three children, but it, it is what those three children got out of it. And I know that because I, I have and do work with those children. So I know that that's what they got out of it. And those are very dangerous thoughts. So fast forward uh, maybe a year or two, and you're, you're having problems at school, um, and your mom is getting calls from the school to say, you know, Susie and, and Johnny, um, boy, those are old-fashioned names. That gave away my age. Susie and Johnny are, um, are behaving badly at school. They're acting out. Um, and uh, just trying to control their friends and, and uh, kind of out of control themselves. Um, so, in comes psychologists at this point to help negotiate the turf. And um, what we learn is that um, Susie and Johnny uh, and Bobby all feel that they really can't manage themselves when mom's not in the picture, which is at school. They either feel that way or it is evident and an evolving realization that they will come to. So these, these are not good things for children to feel. At that age, we want children to be exploring the environment with mom and or dad as a safe haven 
um, and those are those are attachment theory words uh, to help them negotiate the world, to help them figure out what happened at school and um, what it might mean about me, as needed, not on a you know phone call from the principal um, basis. So um, so th those are are very bad things, and that's where we get into sort of how do we recover. So how we recover from from that situation, which has clearly gone horribly wrong, is we we get we either get a, a psychologist such as myself who's qualified and trained to work with attachment uh, type issues um, and rewriting personal narratives, which is what I'll get to next, or a life coach who's had really quite a bit of training in that. Um, I, life coaches that are watching, I do not recommend that you take a case like that unless you really have had that training, if you refer it out to someone who has. Um, and uh, we start to uh, negotiate what's going on. So doing that involves several things. First of all, it might involve having the children start to rewrite their personal narrative, which I will get to in just a moment. Um, and uh, it also involves probably working with mom, and, and if it's a dad who had a, 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 a wife behaving badly, working with dad. Um, <clears throat> because we don't want that parent to come from, to come into the recovery process with a bunch of guilt about how they managed it. Um, and sometimes even very old guilt about, well, maybe I shouldn't have got divorced, maybe I should have just maintained the family and, and dealt with it as best I could. So, um, so those are two things that might be happening simultaneously. Now, getting to the, to the child rewriting their personal narrative. Um, okay, the, the, uh, the ch let's, let's talk about one of the children who pushed the parent to tell, uh, tell him what specifically had happened. What, what dad had done that was unsafe. And it was that um, your father left you uh, in his apartment with, um, with set rat, tra rat traps, with rat poison and set traps that clearly could crush uh, an infant's, a young child's fingers or toes. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and dad crashed out, uh, had had too much to drink, and uh, left you there watching, um, watching Dora the Explorer, or whatever, on TV. And, uh, and you weren't safe, and I found out about it, and the court said that they agreed, dad couldn't see you anymore. So when we start rewriting a personal narrative, um, what starts to come out is the old, that was the old, the old narrative that the child had. What starts to come out in the new narrative is some of the things that mom actually said to him, which is that he was in a, uh, a child swing, not on the floor with the rat traps and the rat poison, and that dad was on the couch asleep, not in the bedroom or God knows where asleep, but on the couch right behind you and Dora the Explorer. So um, that's a, a very different scenario. And clearly it might not have made any difference to the court because the court probably knew other things, like maybe dad had a DUI or something like that. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a judge. Um, I don't go there. Um, but to the child, the difference that it made was this. And these are, these are two, two different children's words, a girl and a boy. So my father did keep me safe. At least in that situation, I was in a playpen, I was in a, a child's lane, and he was in the room. Hmm. Whole different thing. And it becomes part of the narrative. And the narrative starts to change as to what that means about me. I'm worthy of being kept safe. I'm not a throwaway. And I can keep myself safe. Starts to come out too, which is... I don't need mom every moment with me to be kept safe. So these are these are very important distinctions. So so that's sort of uh, rewriting that narrative. As far as um, 
with an older child, my own example, um, yes, I, I did ultimately recover from um, with my parents about our various discussions. But it was years later. Uh, with my dad, it was when I was about 18. With my mom, it was actually later than that. Um, and uh, we recovered by talking it through and by me pointing out some of my narrative changes about it and, um, and, and me doing a lot of journaling work and uh, coming to understand that the fact that mom cheated doesn't mean that I can't judge people. Just because a child, a, a tiny child, can't doesn't somehow intuitively know that mom cheated on her husband before you were born, um, your dad before you were born, doesn't mean you can't judge people, Carmen. That's not what it means. Um, and, um, and the fact that dad cheated on mom isn't about me. It wasn't a betrayal against me. But the fact that I realized in my personal narrative, my rewriting of my personal narrative, that I might have felt that way, I might have felt betrayed, and in adult relationships repeated that betrayal over and over and over again, happily stepped into vulnerable relationships because I felt like, well, I managed dad, I can sure manage this guy. Um, Rewriting my personal narrative helped me move through those challenges. So um, I highly recommend uh, rewriting personal narrative. And I'm going to, right here in, in the video, put up a link um, to another video I did on rewriting your personal narrative. Because it, it doesn't always require a psychologist or a, or a life coach. It is work that we can do on our own as adults. But when you're working with children, I think it's important to get professional help. Uh, and, and it's important that mom not try to write the child's personal narrative for them. So that's pretty much um, what I wanted to talk about today. This is getting a little longer than I had expected. I'm not used to jumping in without a script. Um, so I just once again want to wish all you dads a very happy Father's Day. And all you moms, a very happy day. And all you adult children that are watching, uh, a very happy life. See you soon.